This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first class VPN. Go to hide.me slash epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization in the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have a special guest with us. Uh, he's called Vinay Gupta. Many of you might already know him. He has previously been a CIFA punk, uh, a global resilience guru, a release coordinator for Ethereum, and he's now associated with Consensus. We'll be talking about all of these topics, uh, identity, how to, uh, how to fund public infrastructure and other, other themes. But first, let's have an introduction from the man himself, Vinay Gupta. So hi guys. Uh, so right now I'm split between the uh, Consensus Group and the Ethereum Foundation, uh, mostly working with Consensus. And uh, I'm really kind of in the middle of doing the sort of 2016 kind of planning and analysis just trying to figure out what's going to be important this year and what role I have to play in that. Cool. Can you give us uh, what are your most important, interesting predictions for this year? Well, so I think that up until now, the entire field has been largely limited by available money. You know, you know it's been quite hard to raise funds for projects. Uh, there's been a lot of curiosity from funders, but not very much action. And I think the R3 has kind of tipped the entire ecosystem into a different gear. Like it's legitimized this notion that blockchains are a technology that is critically important to banking. And at that point, the money is seriously beginning to flow into the field. So I think that this is the year where we're going to go from it being you know, scarce money and abundant talent to it being abundant uh, money and scarce talent. And I don't think any of us really know how to operate in that environment. We're so used to having to bang on the doors that now that the doors, I think, are largely auto-opening, uh, I think we're going to have a, a fair amount of chaos. So what I'm trying to do is look at what's happened in the dot-com world over the past 10 or 15 years to try and figure out how our field is going to change and what we have to do to adapt to the new operating environment where we're going from being scrappy outsiders to being the new mainstream. So, so you're predicting a dot, a dot blockchain bubble? Oh, it's already started. I mean, the uh, my estimate is that we're going to see a billion dollars come into the Ethereum ecosystem in 2016 alone. And the general estimates for the amount of money going into the entire blockchain ecosystem, including Bitcoin, is on the order of 10 billion. I think it's 10, 10 billion this year is what we're going to see. Yeah, 10 billion this year. So, 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 so for example, you... JP Morgan yeah. uh, recently released a, a report suggesting that they were going to put 9 billion, actually I think it might be leaked rather than released, but they were going to put 9 billion into the high-tech ecosystem, including drones and blockchains. Government of Singapore has a $7 billion smart cities program uh, and is seriously interested in blockchain stuff. There's just a really, really, really broad-based push from large entities to get this technology into their systems. No, I, I totally agree with that, and I'm certainly very optimistic and bullish on the prospects as well, but th that is definitely a, a different level of... Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah, we'll see if that happens. That, that would certainly be interesting to see what happens then, because you're certainly right, right? There's a, there's a, a certain lack of talent and, and a lot of immaturity too, so if you start having combining that like a maturity of the tech and the knowledge, how to use it and all. So if you combine that with uh, insane inflows of money, I, I agree, you'd probably end up with all kinds of uh, interesting, weird and slightly nonsensical projects. Well, it, one of the things that really strikes me about this is it's very, very hard to pick winners, right? So uh, I saw, you know, this investor, Paul Graham, runs an outfit called Y Combinator. So Graham describes what he thought when he was offered the opportunity to invest in Facebook, which was that it was a tool for people who had no money to do something not very important. Uh, and it was, you know, obviously not going to go anywhere. Right? You know, it's a way for college students to waste time on the internet. They're, that's just, why would anybody even invest in that kind of thing? Lots of people looked at Airbnb and said people are not going to rent each other's living rooms to each other. That's crazy. That's never going to happen. You know, how do we tell what's going to be important and what isn't ahead of time? 
Y yeah, absolutely. So before we keep going with that, let's take a step back and focus a little bit on you on your background. So one of these uh, labels or that are applied to you, that you apply to you, things you call yourself as, as a resilience guru. Can you tell people what what is resilience? What do you mean with that? Well, so my background is disaster relief. I mean, I have many backgrounds. I've done lots of things over the years. But um, I spent many years on a disaster relief technology called the Hexier, uh, which is, um, do you know Burning Man? Have you been to Burning Man? I have been to Burning Man. It's actually funny because I have been to Burning Man and I was I was listening to your interview uh, with London Real, which was uh, fantastic, by the way. Uh, and I heard you say, mention that you invented the Hexiard. And I, have, I was in a Burning Man in 2012. And I remember like Googling about it in preparation and reading about the Hexiard. So I was like, oh, wow, that was you. So yeah, I I I know what you're talking about there, but mm -hmm. perhaps for those who don't know, yeah, what is the hexa yard? Uh, well, so I'm going to show you a picture right here if I can get this damn thing to open. Uh, I guess that'll work. So let's see, how's that for a high tech solution, huh? So there you can see on the screen uh, this silver building sitting in the middle of the desert. Uh, apologies mm -hmm. for it kind of wobbling a little. There we go. So the point of that building is that the wall is a whole sheet of four by eight just as it comes off the track. And the roof pieces are triangles, which are half a sheet of four by eight cut on the diagonal. Zip, boom, there's your triangle. And the reason for doing that is it means that you could take an industrial supply chain, which generates plywood or OSB or polyiso insulation or whatever it happens to be. And you could take the stream of that material add a table saw and maybe a couple of drills to the end of that process and have an emergency housing solution. So it's a really, really, really simple way of generating enormous quantities of housing. And given that we've got 60 million refugees and an ongoing refugee crisis in Europe, it seems like the kind of situation where being able to generate huge amounts of housing really cheaply might be a good idea. Uh, and that's the, the first part of a much broader system. So the second part, if I can just bring this up, uh, uh, apologies for the somewhat uh, low-tech AV solution. So the second part is a thing called the dartboard of death. Can you see this here? The dartboard of right. death. And uh, it's a planning tool called Simple Critical Infrastructure Maps. And it's a way of figuring out if you're going to deploy 60,000 hectares in the middle of a desert field, desert plain, what do you need to provide people as well as the basic physical structure so that they can live. You need maybe some solar panels for communications, you need toilets, you need water filters. But most of all, what you need is a comprehensive map of human needs so that you know whether you've covered everything on uh, the required list or not. And it's actually quite hard to come up with a fully objective, fully comprehensive list of human needs that will apply in all places at all times. Um, but that's what the resilience map system does. Uh, and I did this stuff, uh, I worked a bit with the Red Cross, I worked a bit with the UN, uh, I worked a bit with the American Department of Defense, I worked a bit with DFID in the UK, um, I worked a lot with the team that went on to do the IKEA shelter, the one that they're deploying in Syria uh, and uh, Jordan, I think, right now. Um, and so that's what I did for a really long time. And they use them in enormous numbers of Burning Man. They just download the plans from the internet and build them. There's probably a couple of million dollars worth of them built every year. So uh, what kind of disaster scenarios are you most concerned about personally? Well, so for me, the big thing is climate change. The expectation is that we're going to see something in the region of 150 million people displaced. And the existing humanitarian systems are completely unable to cope with 150 million people who have no place to go back to. So we've got pretty good solutions for doing temporary shelters but we don't have good solutions for long-term or permanent displacement. And most of the people that are displaced by climate are gonna be permanently displaced because their homes are gone and their farmland is covered in salt water or the cities are just covered in mold and they're never gonna be inhabitable again. So, um, so that's a lot of people, like 150 million people displaced is a, is a big, big amount. Cause yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. what's, what's that like? That's, 
uh that might be like you know a few per- like one or two percentage of the world's population so we are talking a very big yeah. number that's right think- that's right okay and uh and you personally see this kind of scenario occurring over the time horizon like what kind of time horizon we've already got 60 million refugees as it stands um so that number is only going to go up until we find some better solution for dealing with them do do cryptocurrencies have a role to play in a scenario like that like like if you have 60 million refugees already and you could go up to 150 million let's say with climate change what role does cryptocurrency tech have there um well so cryptocurrency tech itself is a small part of a much wider set of things you could do um so the technologies that give you the assurance that the bitcoin won't be double spent can also give you things like passports they can give you uh, non repudiatable medical records they could give you you know all kinds of tight uh, control of information and that's really really important to refugees so imagine that you are a refugee and you document every step of your journey on a blockchain right you've got an app on your phone you take some pictures of where you are you know the pictures get uploaded into IPFS the hashes get uploaded into the bitcoin or the ethereum blockchain and every day you take a couple of pictures to document your conditions and document what's happening to you if you've got 100 million people's worth of that stuff as a kind of public log of what's happening it becomes very hard to deny the scale of the problem it becomes very hard to offer substandard services if something goes wrong and these people are for example left to freeze to death as happened in the pakistan earthquakes um it becomes really obvious that you have people recording their damn deaths on camera in a blockchain you know and this forces accountability on the international community um in addition if you've got the ability to issue identity credentials maybe you can get people across borders and then finally you've got the ability to actually give people money using a blockchain um but you know fundamentally i think that there's a big question about accountability and I think that this is fundamentally about blockchains as an accountability technology first and as a currency technology second. So is your interest in blockchains, Bitcoin, Ethereum is that sort of an outgrowth of your interest in resilience and disaster or or do you view it as more of a separate thing that has some areas of intersection? Well, I mean, the fundamental reason I'm in this stuff is because I was a cypherpunk in the 90s. So, you know, in I don't know 96 or 97 I helped some people write some software for getting human rights abuse data out of China. Uh, I was very heavily involved in sort of uh, magic internet money in 99 and 2000 when the technology of choice was a thing called eGold. Uh I wrote a prototype for an append only general ledger based cryptographic stock market with bearer shares in 2000. So I was quite into this stuff. Um when I saw Bitcoin come over the horizon I completely ignored it because it I knew it was just a currency and what I'd seen from the eGold example was that things which were just currencies didn't produce any social change it was better money but it was just better money if you wanted to produce interesting social change uh, what was really required was um smart contracts so when ethereum came over the horizon it was like ah smart contracts are back right that's worth going for a look for right Uh so you know I came over to the Ethereum space and sure enough it was smart contracts and once you have smart contracts you could build an entirely new world. The smart contract is a hugely powerful construct. Uh ex- explain to us like so explain to us why a smart contract is powerful. Okay. So um there's a whole bunch of different reasons why smart contracts are powerful but what they boil down to is this. Right now software exists inside of a given organization or inside of a given individual's property. Even if it's running in the cloud, it's running in a piece of the cloud that you rent and therefore it's your cloud. The result is that the software always has the agency of the person that is paying for the software to exist. And I mean agency in a kind of technical economic sense. It's my software, it's your software, it's their software. And as a result to a large degree software doesn't change the trust architecture that exists in the world. My software is not that different from my staff or my book or my, you know, industrial machine wherever it happens to be. Once you get a smart contract, you have software which isn't yours or mine, it exists in the space between us. So the software is in some sense relational. 
it doesn't exist inside of the nodes, it exists inside of the network. And that's interesting because it generates new architectures of trust. And new architectures of trust, you know, the last time somebody invented a really fundamentally new trust architecture, the output was capitalism. You know, the joint stock corporation was a new way of handling trust. Limited liability was a new way of handling trust. And what came out of that was enormous change. I mean, really, really enormous change. So I think that smart contracts probably won't have quite as much impact as the invention of capitalism, but they could very, very easily be the next stage of capitalism's development. Okay, that's interesting. So, so actually, that's one of the topics I wrote down. I wanted to talk about was the sort of impact of all of this on capitalism. So, which was sort of towards the end, but let's talk about it right now. So, do you view smart contracts as and blockchains as as the next stage of capitalism, or is there also the the potential to have something that's you know truly different and and Economic, forms of economic interaction that aren't well, very well described by the word capitalism. So Buckman Sir Fuller describes what we have now uh, and what we call capitalism as law cap, lawyer capitalism. And lawyer capitalism, basically the transactions are contractual, the contracts grow and grow and grow and grow and grow because that's just the nature of reality that things gain complexity over time. And as a result, over time, more and more and more of the value in the system becomes owned by lawyers. Um, one of the critical examples of that is that the US government is almost entirely made of lawyers. You know, there are almost no engineers in Congress or the Senate. It's lawyers, 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 and more lawyers. So Fuller says that law cap is inherently sort of parasitic, piratical, inefficient, and it has a whole bunch of fundamental problems because the most powerful class of people within lawyer-based capitalism are also the people that have the most to gain from being complex and inefficient. And this results in ineffective economic choices. Um, the notion that you could go to a kind of tech cap, right, a technical capitalism, where the vast majority of the hard decisions are made by software and codified bodies of software take the role that's currently made by law, I think is pretty credible, right? I think that, you know, say 15 years from now, you know, by the time you guys are basically my age, I think it's entirely credible that you could have a situation where you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of software, tens of millions of lines of software that embodies things like a, a uniform commercial code, which could be used for taking 70, 80, 90% of disputes and making an automated resolution on them. So you have a set of trusted third parties or more likely insured and escrowed bonded third parties that input the information into the systems about what happened and then the software makes a resolution based on previous case law and the rules that were programmed into it. Everybody can see the software, therefore everybody knows the outcome of the decision before they actually act. And as a result, you wind up with this very broad, clear lane in which very ordinary transactions never wind up in court because everybody checks a transaction against the legal software before they act, and as a result, their actions are always legal. And I think that that kind of stuff could grow out of the smart contract ecosystem really easily. You know, it's kind of like precognitive compliance. You check against the compliance suite before you act in the same way that you check against the test suite before you upload a new piece of software to your servers. And if it sounds kind of crazy now, how crazy would it have sounded that we would have something like Amazon Prime now in 1995 when we were just, you know, before we'd invented e-commerce? So I agree. I, I think that's a very plausible vision there. That, But essentially where you're going there is that a whole set of economic interactions, they... They're maybe manual now and mediated by courts of law and lawyers a lot, right? They essentially become automated and they also move a little bit at least, or, or probably varies a lot uh, depending on the situation and the environment, but they move a bit out of the out of the grip of the sort of existing legal framework, right? Well, I mean, international business is not going to continue to be tied up inside of nation-state courts forever. That that can't happen. Absolutely, yeah. But if you if you take a, a step back and look at this, is from a little bit more of a macro perspective. 
what is the end result of that? Does that mean we just have the, the sort of capitalism today where you have an enormous power, for example, of the, the wealthy and those, uh, you know, big corporations? Is that is that going even more like that because you have the, the power of the state is being eroded? And so you have, uh, let's say, inequality uh, um, increases even more in a world like that because there's less uh, ability to reinforce, for example, redistribution or... Uh, will you also have, let's say, alternative models where people use things like uh, Ethereum, cryptocurrencies, uh, DAOs to have completely novel models of interaction and in community and economic collaboration? Okay, so um, <laughs> this is where we get to a really, really complex problem. So different societies vote for different kinds of wealth distributions inside of democracies. The Scandinavian societies vote for a more equal wealth distribution and they get it. American society votes for a much less equal distribution and they get it. You go to South America, they vote for really unequal wealth distributions and they get those. Uh, it's my opinion that in almost all societies, the um, democratic mass of people could vote for more equality if they actually wanted it. And in most cases, what happens is they actually don't want that much more equality, right? What they want is more opportunity. And generally speaking, the voters are substantially to the right of the governments, right? So the political party system and four year electoral represent representative electoral democracy and all the rest of that kind of stuff seem to have a stabilizing impact on populations that if they were basically left to make their own laws, would I think be vastly more libertarian, vastly less caring, vastly more selfish than they are now. So for example, I think that it's pretty clear that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, things like the welfare state as a concept are largely being eaten away, not by capitalism, but because the voters just don't care enough to maintain the damn things. So my feeling is that we're in a position where the world is growing increasingly competitive and increasingly selfish, and I think that the way that we choose to deploy these technologies will mirror those values. You're not going to see a fundamental change in how we do things in terms of you know, sharing or welfare states or um, you know, those kind of concerns. We're not going to see a more equal society until people use their democratic power to create one. Because if they're not willing to vote for more equality, they're certainly not going to deploy technologies to give it to them. I think the basic truth is that people right now, just generally speaking, don't care. And we still have to build an efficient world and an effective world with people that are really fundamentally kind of uncaring about each other. We have to make it work in spite of human nature, not because of human nature. Yeah, that's an interesting point of view. I probably disagree with you on, on some levels here. I mean, I think especially the idea that... Uh, people have that much ability to, you know, make real choices. I think if if you look at, like, for example, the United States, it seems to me that the political system is so corrupt and captured by, uh, you know, large industrial interests and lobby groups and stuff that the ability for, I mean, you would need an enormous amount of consensus among the population and sort of... Uh, collaboration and uh, movement to, to really fundamentally change something there. But I, I agree with you on the longer run. Uh, but, I mean, I, that, that, yeah. that is democracy, right? Democracy is that you don't change the rules of society until um, more than half of the people who vote want that change. So the kind of enormous co you know, collaboration that you're talking about to get change to happen, that's what democracy looks like. It requires enormous pressure from, you know, maybe 25 or 40 percent of your population to get change to happen. That's the democratic process. If you've got a situation where smaller numbers of people could cause radical change, you have a very poor representative democracy. Well, I, I don't know if I would agree with that. I mean, I think the, you can have a, a system where there's there's it's so difficult for to have a the opinions from the voters sort of to flow up that in the end uh, 
the entities and the parties that sort of control the executive process, you know, they can have a just enormous amount of latitude that largely remains unaffected by anything else that happens. In the areas where the voters care, they have no trouble at all controlling their political parties. Right? American voters really care about drunk gun control. They have no problem at all making sure that the parties keep them in uh, keep gun control where they want it. The pro-gun people have a party that is always going to be pro-gun and it fully represents that view. The anti-gun people have a party that's fully anti-gun and it fully represents that view. Same thing on abortion rights. Right? In the areas where the voters really care, the parties completely comply and will not move for anything. But you could also say that the two issues you brought up there, gun control and abortion rights, are things that really don't matter that much, right? If, if you, in terms of the actual power structures today, they're like sideshows that nobody really cares about. Well, they sure as hell matter to the voters. Well... And enormously <laughs> powerful, right? And enormously powerful people. I mean, think of the size of the anti-gun lobby in America or the size of the anti-abortion lobby in America. These are huge organizations. The National Rifle Association has something like 4 million members. That's roughly 1% of all Americans, maybe 2%. It's an immense organization. I don't know how big the total collective of all the radical anti-abortion activists is, but it's probably a similar size. You know, these are really, really big pressure groups. They're vastly bigger than the pressure groups around things like access to healthcare, they're vastly bigger than the pressure groups around things like environment. The bottom line is that what you're dealing with here is enormous public apathy about the issues that are important to us but are completely unimportant to them. Yeah, I, I wonder if you're right. I think there's some other things going on as well. For example, if you, you know, they've done experiments where they ask people, uh, ask, for example, Americans, you know, how, what do you estimate is the current wealth distribution? You know, how much uh, of the wealth or income, you know, is earned by the top 1%, top 10%, you know? So they ask that question and they ask, what would you like it to be? And the thing is that what people estimate is completely wrong. And what they would like it to be, that's like Americans tends to align with like the actual wealth distribution in Scandinavia or something like that. So there is a, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know the, I read an article or two about the stuff you're talking about. Yes, it's absolutely true that if you show Americans, you know, you know, wealth distribution graphs, they're shocked by how much money is concentrated at the top, right? But if you tell them, we're going to take everybody who is poorer than you and we're going to give them some of your money, they freak out. Right, but then right. for 99% all... of people, you would ask, you wouldn't actually take their money, but you take the money of those extremely rich, right? So they... Well, okay, so if you're talking about reallocating wealth inside of dominant imperial powers, that's not any, in any way creating social justice, right? If you're stealing from the world at gunpoint, which is basically the business model of empire, you know, a prince is nothing but a stationary bandit, um... If you're stealing from people at gunpoint as a way of fueling your economy, even if inside of your country the economy is very egalitarian and fair, outside of your economy you're still basically rape and pillage Vikings. So every time that the Americans start a war to try and bring the price of oil down, every time that the Americans invade a bunch of South American countries so they can you know, facilitate easier access to either cocaine or bananas, right? All of those kind of processes, if you look at the other end of where America's wealth is created, it's created inside of authoritarian socialism in China, it's created inside of you know, vicious feudalism in Africa. So if you're going to have a society which is genuinely fairer, you've got to remember that the global 1% line is $35,000 a year. If you're making $35,000 a year, you are the 1% globally. So if wealth is going to be reallocated in a fair form, it's going to make almost all of the you know, European and American middle classes radically poorer. And they're going to fight that to the death. 
Let's take a short break to talk about Hide.me. Look, when you're choosing a VPN provider, you want to make sure that your privacy is protected. You know, if a government agency tries to force the VPN provider to hand over some of your traffic or, ban or, or browsing information, will they be able to do that? And is your payment information attached to the account? These are all things that you want to consider when choosing a VPN provider. With Hide.me, all that's taken care of. For starters, they're based in Malaysia, and Malaysian laws don't require them to keep any logs. In fact, Hide.me has no logs of your traffic or browsing uh, history. So even if a government agency was trying to force them to hand over some information, they would be straight out of luck because Hide.me has nothing to give them. In addition to that, they use a third party, party payment provider, uh, which uh, doesn't give them any of your payment information. So they have, they have no way to link an account to like a credit card or a PayPal account. So even if you're paying with PayPal or credit card, there's no way for Hide.me to know which account paid for what. And of course, if you're paying with Bitcoin, then you're completely transparent. And uh, so what we suggest is if you're creating an account with Hide.me, if you want that extra level of privacy, just make a fake Gmail address and use that to sign in. So that way you're completely anonymous. You can give Hide.me a try with their free plan. Their free plan includes two gigabytes of data at unthrottled bandwidth. You can use any of their free exit nodes, which are in Amsterdam, in Singapore, and in Montreal. And you can sign up for that at hide.me slash epicenter. Now, if you use our URL, and if you decide to go premium down the line, it's gonna get you 35% off. And the premium plan gives you a lot. It gives you unlimited data. You can use as much as you want. You can connect up to five devices, so your whole household fits on the plan and you can use any of their exit nodes all over the world and they've got like 30 of them. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try. We would like to thank Kite.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So uh, so like like universal basic income, uh, do you think blockchains could enable, en enable that and how? Ah, so I did a talk about this uh, for State of the Net in, uh, oh, where the heck was it? Uh, Milan, right? State of the Net, Milan, There's I did a half hour, maybe an hour talk on universal basic income and blockchains. Um, pretty easy to find. Uh, maybe I'll send you guys a URL or something. So my basic thinking is that it's very, very easy to do universal basic income on blockchains and Blockchains are a really good medium for experimenting with universal basic income because you can record and watch all the spending to know exactly how the universal basic income was spent. And as a result, it becomes really, really a lot easier to justify whether these programs are working or not. So I, I'm quite in favor of blockchains as a prototyping technology for you know these kind of radical um, changes in uh, social policy. You know, whether it's universal basic income, whether it's some kind of tax credit for people who have three children in countries with a low birth rate, uh, whether it's a change in retirement age. If you're going to have a change in social policy that you could conceivably document on blockchains, I think there are really good reasons for doing it because it allows everybody that's either for or against the change to look at the same uh, non-editable data set to make their arguments about the effectiveness of the policy. So I'm definitely for that. So, for for instance, like universal basic income, for might have a shape like you have a small island. Let's imagine a small island with two two hundred thousand people, and they essentially run a blockchain, and the issuance schedule, like 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 Bitcoin has an issuance schedule where new bitcoins are issued to the miners that solve the blocks. In mm -hmm. this in this imaginary uh, blockchain, in order, in addition to new coins being issued to the validators or miners you have coins being issued every year to each citizen on the island yes yeah, sure sure like is that a good imagination of universal basic income that sounds very much like aurora coin which was a project floated for iceland iceland's about three hundred thousand people and the idea is we're going to have some kind of system uh, tied to the icelandic national id number so in iceland they have a national id number called a kenitala uh, and everybody's Kenital is visible in a basically like a phone book context. So they're never used for identifying people in any kind of private situation. Um, but they're used for things like library cards. And it's a, it's a really smart system. It's actually quite, it's quite intelligent. Um, because they're so public, uh, the assumption is not that your Kenitala identifies you. 
you know, you can, they're ever used for verifying an identity because anybody can look them up openly, but they are used for convenience. It's a really smart system. Um, so, yes, if a country like Iceland implemented something like a Aurora coin that had broad popular support and it worked, no reason it couldn't be tried, and you could document the success or the failure of the project as it went. Whether it would work in terms of making a better society, I'm not at all sure, because there are two problems. The first is, uh, you, redistrib you know, redistributing wealth has a very bad history. So you start with universal basic income, the landlords increase the rent by 20% to soak up all the money that comes in, society continues exactly as it was and all that you've done is subsidize the landlords. We don't know whether that will happen in practice, but it certainly could happen in theory. Another problem is that universal basic income distributes wealth, but not power. So <clears throat> you're not going to necessarily wind up with a better, or fairer, or a more equitable society, because if you redistribute wealth, but you don't redistribute power, all that will happen is that people continue, people with power will continue to change the rules of the game to benefit themselves. So I think that universal basic income is probably coming. It seems like an inevitable next step in social policy, but I have a feeling that it's going to create a bunch of new problems, and maybe that's just the nature of progress. Fix some problems, create others. So, um, so, so like, like that's an interesting perspective that it doesn't change the nature of power. And I'd actually like to merge that with your with your earlier point about the system that we are in being lawyer capitalism. So the way the way I read I read your comment is um, that today due to the due to the fundamental nature of contracting in 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 capitalism what ha ends up happening is there's a lot of administrative cost in order to make these contracts and uh, have them maintained and then uh, and then have them like have the dispute settled now because of this high administrative costs the class of lawyers becomes very powerful in a society and pow because power concentrates in these class of lawyers and they end up having having political positions they tend to make the rules of society even more complex they make to t they tend to make the contracts even more complex because that is how their their class makes uh, makes the living in the first place so it's kind Absolutely. of a kind kind of a circle where you are a lawyer you be you 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 become a politician you have the power to make laws and you make ever more complex laws because that's how people in your class are going to benefit and slowly the complexity of our social structure becomes way more than it needs to be. Yes. Do you know the uh, the old joke about the Indian bureaucrats? No, I don't. So the joke is that if you're a bureaucrat in India, you know, you're the head of a department, when you have a, a child, you make a new form at the, uh, in your department. And over the next 25 years, the form gradually becomes more complex and it grows some additional forms. And then you get some processing and then you get some regulation. And uh, then you get, you know, some oversight. And by the time that you're done, the form over 25 years grows into a department. And then when your kid uh, graduates from law school, you install them as the head of the department. And this is the kind of, you know, organic biological growth of the complexity of the Indian bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of not. Yeah, no, I, like... For for our listeners, like I'm, I I I grew up in India, and my father was in the Indian government, and this is actually true. It's like uh, bureaucracy <laughs> runs in families. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Like, like you know, my grandfather was in the government. My father was. I turned out to be the black sheep that's in Bitcoin doing the opposite thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you say you say that now, but eventually the government will adopt Bitcoin, and then you'll become part of the government. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Dharma and karma, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, so, what you're essentially saying is, like, in smart contracts, we have we have an uh, alternative to lawyer capitalism, where you, in theory, you could have contracts that, while they may be rigid, like the cost of uh, cost of maintaining them, implementing them, maintaining them and settling disputes is much lower than the than the system with lawyers. And this can actually make society more efficient because it uh, it kind of 
gives you an alternative sort of structure to the lawyer capitalism. Yes, exactly. Right. So, you know, the 70, 80, 90 percent of commercial disputes that could potentially be settled with a pretty simple system where you take the body of law, you write it up as a smart, set of smart contracts, and then you have professionals that input reliable data into those systems. And if they're found out to be lying or they, uh, they, or they turn out to be wrong, you have an insurance system that basically uh, covers the claims that result from those errors. Right. So you still have some humans in the loop because the humans have to decide what the facts of the case were. But once you decide the facts of the case, the machinery makes the decisions. And I think that we could probably resolve huge percentages of the current system's uh, lawsuits in those kind of conditions. It's going to take a long time to write the software. But if you think of the complexity of something like a self-driving car, I don't think it's at all unreasonable to think of a self-overseeing uh, self contract. And this is this is definitely futurism, but you know, think of all the airline tickets, all of the package deliveries, all of the you know purchase orders, all the rest of this kind of stuff. There are huge parts of society which is just the same handle being turned over and over and over and over and over again. You know, venture capital deals you know come with a bunch of contracts which are enormously complicated. But if you had a bunch of smart contracts where you basically just punched in a bunch of parameters. You know, what's the equity split? Who are the owners? You know, who's meant to be in charge? Then, you know, if there's a later lawsuit, the vast majority of that stuff would just get sorted out by software. And I think that's entirely reasonable. Over time, it could take 10 or 15 years, but over time, I think the repetitive parts of the law will be automated. I, I think the, it's interesting. I, I've talked with some people also about uh, smart contracts exactly in that way. And of course, uh, the effects from an economic perspective is that when we look at what happened with automation, you know, at, at one point there was all the blue collar jobs got automated. And this is a lot of these sort of not super creative white collar, you know, middle class office jobs happening the exact same thing to that. Yes. Class war. <laughs> I would also like to tie in like two or three more threads from, from your life into, into this discussion, right? So to kind of make this whole point very, uh, very real in, in front of us. Like you've been a cypherpunk and uh, in, in this show you said that you were involved with the digital, like the digital gold uh, movement in, in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you, you, you had the feeling that they created better money, but they didn't have the potential for a better society because they didn't have the con technology of smart contracts. Uh, yes. My basic questions are like, who is the cypherpunk fundamentally? What did they want and why did they fail? Ah, well, this is a very interesting question, right? So this goes all the way back to GCHQ in the 1970s. GCHQ is the English equivalent of the NSA, Government Communication Headquarters. And they invent public key cryptography at GCHQ a good few years before it's reinvented inside of the public domain. Um, there's a really good write-up about that kicking around called something like the alternate history of cryptography. So <clears throat> once you've got public key cryptography, you have the ability to generate secure communications between people that have never met each other, and digital signatures and digital signatures give you the potential for very high levels of trust, again, between people that have never met and never will. So in the early 1990s, Phil Zimmerman implements these you know, algorithms inside of PGP, pretty good privacy. And then there's a wave of sort of, you know, this kind of speculative technological futurism where a bunch of engineers and a bunch of business people and a bunch of science fiction writers and a bunch of journalists sit around and talk about the future relative to some new technology. So right now that conversation is happening around life extension, it's happening around automation, drones, right? A little bit around Bitcoin. Um, so out of those conversations comes this realisation that the natural shape of a society which has public key cryptography is a fundamental part of it, is radically different from the shape of society we have today. It's as different from the society that we have today as capitalism was from feudalism or industrialism was from farming. Right. 
So the people that embrace that as a perspective become cypherpunks. They become people who say, look, relative to the modern technology base, a completely different society is possible, and that completely different society would be better than the one that we have now for the following reasons, and off they go and they make that case. And the result of that kind of whole process, that whole push, is this model that fundamentally this kind of encryption is a human right, <clears throat> and access to that kind of encryption is fundamental to human freedom, which puts the cypherpunks into direct conflict with the state, because the state is basically the American government. It's like, no, 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 no. These are munitions, and you don't need to own public cryptography any more than you need to own a personal landmine. Don't do it. So the process of that struggle realigns the cyberpunks, uh, uh, sorry, the cypherpunks, realigns them into a much uh, more strongly anti-government movement than they had been initially. And that struggle for legitimacy goes on for several years until the entire thing basically washes out after 9-11. So 9-11 happens and the cypherpunk movement really hugely loses momentum because the national security state basically is going crazy. It's like a bull in a china shop. And nobody really feels that that stuff is kind of relevant anymore at that point. <clears throat> Except Julian Assange. So there's a long kind of dead period where not much happens. Then you get Assange and then you get Snowden. And Snowden is basically the, the point where the cypherpunk movement finally bit the government in a way that mattered because Snowden takes an enormous repository of documents out of the NSA and publishes them, and it becomes completely clear to anybody that's paying attention that the American government has slipped into being something along the lines of a police state or a fascism, and we're in the very early process, uh, there are very early parts of the process to repair that now. Now that Snowden's made it visible to the political elites in America that they are being spied on, eventually they will find a way to stop it, and then we'll have a, a kind of new vision of America emerge. So, uh, so now, 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 let's 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 get let's put this conversation in some perspective. Um, most of our listeners, and including us, are people who have not lived the cypherpunk movement. And for us, public key, public key, private key cryptography is kind of a granted. We don't we don't really know the history you you uh, they went through. Tell us, like in in your in your answer, there was a statement that. Like public key cryptography is such a fundamental invention that if you take it to its conclusion, that society would be so radically different from the current one that uh, it, the, that difference is the same as the difference between industrial society and an agricultural society. Tell us why this is such a fundamental invention. Okay, so <clears throat> um, that's a really tricky question. Right? It's really, really subtle. Let me take a crack at it. So, throughout human history, the only way to prove to somebody that you knew a secret was to tell them what the secret was. And that's been the status of information as it flowed through human societies since the invention of dirt. Right? It's, it's an ancient, ancient truth that if I know a secret, my, the only way for me to communicate that secret to you is to tell you the secret. And once in a while, people have figured out ways around that property that gave them a little bit of an advantage and they've used those. So a good example of this is that around the time of the early days of the scientific revolution, um, scientists used to make predictions that they thought were too ridiculous to really publicly claim, but if somebody else thought the idea and it turned out to be true or they could prove it later on, they wanted to establish when they had had the idea. So they used to publish strings of letters. And the strings of letters, it would be like A13, B11, C41, D11, you know, uh, E19. And what it would refer to is a sentence, and you were counting the number of times a given letter appeared in the sentence. And at a later date, you could publish the sentence, and the sentence would correspond exactly to the letter count that had been published. And this was like a very primitive form of a hash function. Right? And scientists were using that stuff as a way of establishing seniority of claim on radical ideas that they didn't really dare publish until they had strong evidence, but it was a way of dating your hunches, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, similar kinds of things happen around commercial use of ciphers. Um, you know, the Rothschilds have a private communication network, which I seem to remember was largely carrier pigeons with, 
can't remember whether these codes or not. Various the Templars had codes. So there's always been a use of those technologies inside of the frameworks, right? The system of the world has always used cryptography where it's been available. They've always used you know, things like hash functions and primitive forms. Once you come along and you build systems like that that are essentially perfect, hugely, hugely powerful things begin to happen. Um, you know, if I can send a completely secret message to anybody in the world and it's impossible for anybody to break that and read the message, things like espionage become trivial. Anybody inside of a government can send an encrypted message to somebody with a bunch of government secrets in it and the government will have no way of knowing what was inside the message so you can't prove the espionage occurred. Sounds completely crazy, more or less what happens every time somebody leaks something from inside of a government these days. Um, you also get a whole bunch of abilities to turn things like free speech into what you would call a performative speech act. So if I speak, I am spending this Bitcoin and put a digital signature on it, that speech is actually the spending of the Bitcoin. So you wind up in a position where the economy becomes completely unified with the culture because spending is trans speaking and speaking is transacting. God only knows what that turns into in the long run, but when you take the things like the absolute right to free speech which is commonly enshrined in the American model, then what comes out of the fact that spending is speech is this notion of unlimited opportunities to spend in ways that people consider radical because you're still protected by your free speech rights. Everything you look at, if you look at it in the right way, that could conceivably touch cryptography even at a theoretical level, is currently turning itself inside out. The whole thing is in free fall. Okay, very interesting. Now, uh, the the thing that Mayor was re referring to, right, it's a, it's a talk of you, so we'll link to that as well, that you gave a DEF CON about sort of uh, cypherpunks and, and why the, their vision didn't really pan out and wasn't so successful. Now, you gave a few reasons in there, and there's yeah, one that, the that I... The public infrastructure problem, predominantly. That's one. That's one, and I would like to talk about that, but there was also another one that I thought was would be very interesting to talk about, which... Uh, you called meta structures. Uh, we we can start with either one. So meta structures is a polite word for companies, corporations, governments, guilds, and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And the tools that the cypherpunks generated were point to point communication tools. Encrypted messaging, whether it was email or chat, was the core thing that cypherpunks produced. Um, for example, HTTPS, you know, the the secure standard used for doing things like credit card payments or logins online, HTTPS was a cypherpunk technology. Um, so while you're in a position where you're deploying the crypto in a way that is largely about point-to-point -point communication, you can't have a situation where you've got a 25-person sort of group that votes on something and it's all secure. So you can't have, say, a company board do a bunch of deliberation on... Uh, Self-decisions they want to make. You can't, you know, you can't go through and you know have a voting or a democratic process or a jury process, and then somehow have that represented to the world in a cryptographically secure way. There's just no really good way of doing it inside of those models. Once you bring along new technology like smart contracts that allows you to do that kind of thing, you get hugely greater expressive power. So the same set of algorithms generate a vastly new set of social possibilities. So the cypherpunk tooling that we had before Ethereum really didn't support group formation very well. It didn't support running organizations. It didn't support things like jury trials. It was really, really limited to people basically writing each other secure letters. And once you open up beyond that, all kinds of other things become possible. How does that relate to what we are seeing today with, the, for example, the debate about the block size in Bitcoin do you think that's really sort of maybe Bitcoin is one of the last technologies that's successful on, on a sort of huge scale, sort of cypherpunk technologies as successful that hasn't explicitly built in some sort of, you know, formal governance structure that allows decision making on a protocol level to happen? So Bitcoin's problem was that, you know, if people thought that well, people thought, Satoshi clearly thought, that Bitcoin was illegal, right? He seems to function on the assumption that he was going to get nuked by the feds for having written this piece of software, so he didn't really want to be 
in the public eye and therefore he built no governance structure. The sort of notion was that it was essentially leaderless resistance. And I think that Satoshi would probably have been horrified by the idea that the federal government would embrace Bitcoin to the extent that it has, uh, never mind Wall Street. You know, I don't think Satoshi would be pleased about that at all. Um, but given that you know, these technologies are being rapidly embraced by governments and by companies, there's a pretty good chance that actually you know, the machinery is not going to try and destroy these technologies and that means you could build governance structures that are really public and open and transparent in the way that charities are and still build cryptographic, um, I don't know what you'd call them, cryptographic social transformation tools. But because it you... seems like what's happening is that the state has simply stopped thinking of this kind of cryptography as a threat, at which point there's no reason to be underground. But couldn't you have a, a governance structure where you do have transparency in all of those things, but you also have uh, the participants, you know, you have the anonymity of the participants. So can't you have both? Yeah, oh, you could, there's, oh, there's no doubt that you could build that, right? No doubt at all. But at this point in history, it seems like there's not much of a reason to, right? You know, there hasn't actually been any kind of really, really heavy state level retaliation or retribution against say Bitcoin users or even Bitcoin devs. For the most part, you know, the governments are basically looking at these as being a new generation of database technology that they can integrate and assimilate. So the revolutionary claim that this technology was going to hugely impact the function of the state and it was going to be this, you know, kind of endpoint tax starvation, disintermediation, Tim May Cypher Nomicon kind of a trip which was a huge part of the claim made in the 1990s, that doesn't seem to be what's happening. The state just seems to be adapting. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised by that. But uh, my point would probably be, uh, well, a few things. So number one is they didn't have to, right? Because Bitcoin is still like a completely irrelevant if you look at it from a larger economic perspective, right? So they, they, were, they could enforce a lot of things on the level of exchanges and wallets and and they never had to go to the protocol level. But if you did have, let's say Bitcoin became very big, and then those developers had that crucial role, and let's say they said, oh, we're gonna do you know, zero cash or something like that, it's gonna be like a part of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I cannot imagine that you would not have an enormous amount of pressure on those people. And I think if that was, you know, if the, the control structure of a project like that was public, uh, you know, I mean, I think the government, we would see a completely different government response than we have seen so far. Maybe they just use the software for running the black budget. You think the US government uses Bitcoin to run black budgets? No, no, but they certainly could, right? I mean, do you think that having this kind of, you know, anonymous secret transactional infrastructure would be in some way a threat to the government? But if that was a threat to the government, why does the government fund Tor? Remember, Tor is a US government funded project and it has been since before the beginning. So if they were afraid of these kind of technologies, there's no reason to fund Tor. The official reason that the US government says that it funds Tor is to provide cover traffic for the US Navy's communications at sea. Right? I just don't think the government really is threatened by these technologies. They don't respond like they're being threatened. They seem to be quite eager for this stuff to mature so they can use it for stuff. Think of how much more convenient the reconstruction of Iraq and Afghanistan would have been if they'd had Bitcoin. No need to ship enormous, you know, crates of cash, a billion dollars strapped to an enormous wooden plank, you know, wrapped in cling film, dropped off a plane to some local warlord. You just sent the guy Bitcoin. There's almost nothing that the government cannot find a use for at given time. So I think that we're in a position where what's happening is that we're seeing social change because new technology has arrived and the state is adapting to the social change in the same way that the state usually adapts to the social change. Yeah, it's, I, I, I think, again, I'm, I'm, I, I view it a little bit differently. I mean, I think there's, there's a variety of ways to use that technology, right? So, I mean, in a way, blockchains are agnostic, right? They, they don't have an inherent value. You can use it for all kinds of things. And there's certainly things where governments can use that technology and 
do things that are perfectly reasonable uh, and attractive to a government, and then you know they will do that. They will use it, right? But at the same time, if yeah. you have something like Bitcoin, for example, or Ethereum as well, right? You can also see a lot of uses that they cannot control. And I, I would think that those instances of those uses of technologies are not things that governments will like to see. Because it is, in the end, it is a, a, loss of con a loss of power, right? If government doesn't like to see that stuff, why did they fund Tor? Tor is a key technology for this so-called culture of anonymity and all the rest of that stuff. And the government has put millions and millions of dollars into Tor. How do you explain that? I mean, uh, so number one, I would say it, it very much seems to be the case, right, that the NSA or some of government agencies do have the capability to de-anonymize Tor. So if you look at it from that perspective, maybe it's not such a bad tool, right? You have all these people who think they need to hide things from the government, like self-identify themselves by using Tor, and then the only people who can uh, find, you know, track them down is like the U.S. government, right? So that's one thing I would... So you, so you basically think that Tor is an enormous honeypot run by the U.S. government. Is that what I, you're saying? I mean, I suspect it has become that at least. That's... I'm, I'm not saying it was planned to right. go that way, but uh, from my superficial impression of the project, it seems to have sort of evolved into that. Hmm. I mean, that is a very uh, controversial statement. I know a lot of Tor, Tor developers, you know, uh, on Twitter seem to be, you know, rejecting that position very, very strongly over and over again as loudly as they can. Um. I guess we wait and see what happens, right? Maybe some future leaker will reveal what the real status of Tor is. Um, but if the government doesn't find Tor to be fundamentally a threat, I don't see any reason why they would find Bitcoin to be fundamentally a threat. Right? I think that the evidence is that they're fairly neutral towards these technologies. Today's magic word is hexayurt. H-E-X-A-Y-U-R-T. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So, so Vinay, uh, you, you are a global resilience guru and your kind of one of your big interests is to think about how can things go wrong. So what you're essentially saying is uh, this scenario that the American government, the Chinese government, and the Russians will partner together to clamp down on cryptocurrency is is not an not an interesting threat to worry about uh, no i just i don't i don't see any real incentive for them to do it you know i just don't see any evidence that they're heading in that direction i think if anything what you're going to see is massive use of these currencies by the intelligence community to hide their operations use of these currencies to you know manage I don't know, chunks of stuff with the black budget um you know, I just don't perceive this stuff to be a threat to state power in the way that people seem to think it is. And by, by the way, the reason that I don't think it's a threat to state power is because the state doesn't react to it as if it was remotely worried. There isn't even the slightest trace of anxiety on the behavior of the US government towards these things. Right? You want to see something the US government has anxiety about, look at the way that they basically smashed Occupy with a big hammer. Right? That's what it looks like when the US government doesn't like you. It's people kicking down your door and pepper spraying your dog. And that's just not happening inside of the Bitcoin community. People aren't being arrested. They're not being investigated. They're not being hassled. The state is completely complacent. And either that's the worst mistake in human history or actually they've looked at it and decided that it just doesn't matter that much. And, and what about the other movement? So, so we, like... Like you talked about how we had lawyer capitalism and I'm going to term the smart contract bureaucracy that is coming, hopefully, as programmer mm -hmm. capitalism. So what you're saying is we're moving from lawyer capitalism to programmer capitalism, right? Do you think the state would be worried about that? No, I think the state will simply be run by programmers. Right? I mean, look, if Steve Jobs had lived, what do you think the odds are that Steve Jobs would have joined the you know, 2016 presidential race, probably running as a Republican, right? Zero percent. I'm Steve. 
No, I, I really think that Jobs was so pissed off about the government preventing Apple from offering strong encryption on their phones. I think there's a real chance that Jobs would have decided that he was going to run for government. You know, go in there and try and fix the problem from the inside. Just imagine it for a moment, right? So if Jobs ran for president, you know, you're already using my telephone. You're going to get a message from me about my presidential campaign on your iPhone every morning, <laughs> whether you like it or not, you can't turn it off. Right? I'm going to come up with a bunch of super smart guy Silicon Valley policies for fixing America. They're going to have some elements from the right and some elements from the left. They're going to use smart use of technology to fix real problems you have. We're going to take all of this great thinking we did that produced the devices that are educating your children and facilitating the smooth function of your life, and we're going to automate the federal government. Right? Okay, so Jobs is dead. It's not going to be Jobs. Um, uh, what about the guy that used to run Google, Eric Schmidt? Right? 2020 election. What about Elon Musk? Gets the rockets going pretty well, decides that the weak link in his plan for saving the world is actually the US government, thinks that it might be possible to fix it from the inside. It's only a matter of time until somebody from Silicon Valley with enough power and enough reputation and enough money decides that the right place to steer the world from is not an office, but the White House. It's only a matter of time. That's actually exciting. Yeah, I mean, I, per, personally, I think the U.S. government is, is, is such a terrible state that it can only, almost only get better. And right. uh, I mean, your choice at this point is a military coup or a takeover by Silicon Valley. I think you'd rather have a takeover by Silicon Valley. Right. Uh, but I think the interesting thing there, if you looked at Obama and, you know, when he came with all these plans he had, and then if you look objectively at what he's done, he's done nothing. None of the things he said, he's basically been... He's well, basically he's, been, the black, he's been the black Ronald Reagan. Yeah, you could say that, right. Uh, so you can ask, like, why was that, right? So there's only two explanations, really, right? One, either he was completely dishonest about it, Right. So he was he was literally lying and like saying things to get elected, but he didn't actually mean them. Or is he, he a came in is there. Is he a politician? Is he a politician? Were his lips moving? <laughs> <laughs> right. But do you I mean, I mean, lying to an extent, which is almost like mind blowing about everything like his or he came in there. It, he had maybe it, he lied a little where, bit. He had this. Yeah. Is he a politician and were his lips moving? <laughs> <laughs> right? Politicians are professional liars. So we know for sure he was lying. At least about some things. Politicians go out and say whatever will get them elected. For the well, but there's different extents, extents here. I would, of course, agree that all politicians lie of course, probably quite a lot, right? But it's about, is it just distorting the truth or is it literally saying the exact opposite of what you actually want to do? Um, okay, so what's the second part? The, well, the second explanation, of course, is that he was probably lying like all politicians lie with a lot of things, but that overall, you know, a lot of his intention, things he was saying was also, you know, genuine intentions and a desire to do that. But then he came into office and he literally could not do any of those. Maybe he didn't well, yeah. even... In, in as much as, right, the Republicans wind up controlling both Congress and Senate, which leaves the president with very little ability to make law. And if you can't get them to vote for your laws, you don't have that much power to steer the country. The American government is meant to be a government of laws, not of men. The president is not meant to have more power than Congress and the Senate. So if the Congress and the Senate are Republican and the president is Democrat, it's a bad time to be president because the power is with the lawmakers, not with the executive branch. Right, but the Congress and uh, Senate weren't Republican the whole time he was president. No, they weren't Republican the whole time, but they were Republican in the second term, which is where politicians typically do all the radical stuff. Okay, before, like, okay, so that's, uh, I, I, think, I think we have reached an impasse. So the last question. Uh, and by the way, I'm not discounting the power of the black state here, right? Military industrial complex and all the rest of that stuff is absolutely there. And it's absolutely real and it's enormously powerful. But 
the US population is largely served pretty well by the military industrial complex, which is why they don't use their power to throw them over. The military industrial complex is a pretty good representation of what average American wants. That's the problem. If they didn't want it, there would be huge mass demonstrations about the injustice of American society all the time. Sanders would have like 90% of the vote and the democratic <laughs> machinery would just shove these guys right over. The problem is the military industrial complex is giving most Americans most of what they want most of the time, which is a chance at opportunity and a ton of national security power. That's why they don't change it. That's something to think about. The military-industrial complex is a representation of what the average American wants. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, before, before we close out, because we have already reached uh, the, the end, like the end of our like, standard interview. Okay. Like one question. Uh, what does, give us a vision for programmer capitalism. What does it look like? What, what's different from lawyer, what's different in programmer capitalism from lawyer capitalism? Okay, so let me frame this, right, look at the good side, then look at the bad side. Or maybe look at the bad side and the good side. So the bad side of programmer capitalism would be the programmer industrial complex, which is basically robotic war machines, robot traffic wardens, and a massive surveillance state that you know, gives you a machine that you carry around at all times that constantly spies on you and reports everything you do to the government. <laughs> that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Yeah, that sounds terrible. Okay. <laughs> right? You pay for your own surveillance device, and all of the information on your phone goes to the government already. Right? We're already seeing programmer capitalism. It's called the NSA. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. So the bad side of this is that you get increasing power going to the technical branches of the state, so the NSA becomes a larger and larger thing. The US military becomes increasingly robotic. You send the robots out to fight your wars. You know, third world peasant uprising where they're threatening to cut off the banana supply is met by Ed 209 from Robocop, dropped from the sky in enormous numbers, and they basically just keep shooting until there's no more RI signatures. Then you send down the robots to go and harvest the bananas. <laughs> right? You know the term banana republic? It actually came from American invasions organized by banana companies. Mm -hmm. Look it up. Look up the history of Banana Republic. The history is mind-blowing. So that is the kind of nightmare scenario of this kind of robot-driven technocratic imperialism. And it's clear that the American military is pushing for that as hard as they can possibly go. Everybody agrees that putting American soldiers into the path of angry brown men with guns is a losing proposition. Every time they try it, they come back with a bunch of dead white boys and no real progress in their foreign policy objectives, right? It just doesn't work to have very expensive, very precious American soldiers who are very expensive to recruit and very expensive to train, fighting peasants who are making, you know, $1.50 an hour and are, you know, using a 30-year-old AK-47. It just doesn't work. Um, that's the downside. The upside is a society in which everything that the government does is transparent and accountable and systems are provably fair because the software makes the decisions. So the law that's made by Congress or the Senate is encoded as software. The software then makes the actual decisions the vast majority of the time. So are you eligible for healthcare is decided by a piece of software that takes 15 seconds to give you an answer. And if the answer is no, it tells you exactly why the answer is no. And if there's a factual error in that, you take it to a human being that is certified as being able to restate the facts for the computer, they restate the facts in an accurate form, and you get your healthcare coverage. Right? So you could build stable, predictable, transparent bureaucracies that manage the shared assets of society in a completely predictable way. The tax code could become a piece of software with minimal human interpretation. Right? Your tax advisor basically takes the facts, writes the facts down, swears the facts are true. If the facts aren't true, they're going to face an enormous fine, which will be covered by their insurance. And if they're proven to have lied intentionally, they're going to go to jail. So you put all of the emphasis on accurate inputs into software that then makes decisions in a completely transparent way. And I think that you could see something come out of that that is hugely more efficient than the current government is. 
and is provably fair because it operates on you know clearly stated truth rather than on ambiguous human judgment. Um, would a system like that be better for all things that the state does? Definitely not. But I think that there's a 60, 70, 80% middle of the road, just shit shoveling thing that the state does that could potentially go away pretty comprehensively. And I think that that's really worth doing. Two extremes. Cool. Cool. Brian. I think that's a, that, close out. that's a that's a good note to to end on. We have some some exciting visions about the future. Of co- of course, I, I, I <laughs> if we do if we do have this robo banana republic thing and, and that is driven by the industrial military complex, it, it does sort of seem to imply that that's what the American people want. No. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, look, in two thousand and four, the American people voted for Bush again. That undoubtedly right. is... Everybody knew, right? Yeah. They They're did, not yeah. that unhappy, right? The American people, on average, are not that unhappy about the status quo. There are a small number of very intelligent, very well-educated, science fiction reading, predominantly white males, who are of the opinion that they're being completely screwed by the system. Right? And that demographic ranges from the guys that are out there in Oregon occupying some, you know, national wildlife preserve or whatever it is, the Bundy Ranch guys, right the way across through the kind of new left, right the way out through the back end of, you know, extreme politics, anarchism, the cypherpunks, all the rest of that stuff, right? But actually, you know, the feeling that something has gone wrong and it's the government's fault is pervasive right across the societal class, which is losing power. And... That societal class is losing power to minorities and it's losing power to women and it's losing power to the people on the other end of the supply chain in China. The core thing which motivates the vast majority of political resistance to the state is, you know, basically people that were privileged slowly losing economic advantage to classes that were previously less privileged or dirt poor. Nobody wants a fairer world except for the very, very poorest half of humanity. And the poorest half of humanity are largely peasant farmers living on a single acre of agricultural land that they inherited from their great, 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 great grandparents and which their grandchildren will live and die on in all probability. That's 50% of humanity, right? People say they want a fairer world. What they generally mean is they want to be richer. The fairer world is a world that starts with improving the lives of the peasants in the very, very poorest areas because they are the people that need the help most and we have to work up from there by layers. The political axis that we're operating on is largely a fantasy, right? We've got this kind of colonial world model that we inherited from generation to generation after generation of imperialist wars, largely propagated by Europeans and Americans against the rest of the world. And what's happening is that as the colonial era ends, because the rest of the world now has manufacturing capacity, it now has independent political thought, it's really beginning to catch up. The bubble of privilege that colonialism created for people is collapsing, and the people that are hit hardest are the people that were profiting the most from colonialism. And that's the white males. So the anger that the white males feel towards the government is that the government is no longer making them rich. And different people express that pain in different ways, depending on where they come from in the political spectrum. So once you start separating the loss of privilege from fairness, a fair, you know, a fairer world is a world in which the poor do much better and the rich do much worse. And most of the time people aren't campaigning for that because they don't identify themselves as being the rich and they definitely don't want to think about how much poverty there is. And once you get clear about that, you see the real revolutionary possibility of blockchains, which is they could provide statistical evidence of how the world really works, and then we could use that statistical evidence to force real change where it really matters. And it's up to us as a society to decide where that really is. First the facts, then the decisions. That's what I wanted to say. All right. Well, Vinay, thanks so much. I think we can we can wrap up with that. So thanks so much for coming on. I mean, I think you're you're super elaborate and eloquent in expressing very interesting and unusual and sometimes viewpoints that one disagrees with. But I think that makes for the most interesting discussions. Um, 
so of course we will link to uh, to a lot of uh, your resources so we'll link to your resilience website uh, some of the work you've done with hexagirds and also some of your uh, other talks you've done which are very interesting so thanks so much renee for coming on splendid really good to talk and um yeah really a pleasure thank you <laughs> And thanks to listener for listening. So we are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. So you can find lots of other shows as well on letstalkbitcoin.com. And we put out new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can get them you know, with your favorite podcast application, whether it's on iOS or Android. And of course, you can watch the videos also on youtube.com slash epicenterbtc. And if you are, if you want to, you can leave us an iTunes review or review anywhere. You send us an email, and then we will send you one of those T-shirts. So we'll, we're still doing that. We've sent out t lots of T-shirts all over the place, and yeah. So if you want one, then just do that. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.